Welcome everyone to the March 29th, 2021 Hadley Public Schools meeting. I can't believe it is almost April already. And here is Humera. And let me just correct. Hold on one second. Okay, great. Hi, Humera. We're just getting started. Great. Hello. How are you? Great. Good. Thanks. Um, so again, welcome. March 29th, 21, uh, Hadley Public Schools com um, School Committee meeting. Is there a motion to call the meeting to order? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. And our first uh, question is, are there any adjustments to the agenda for tonight? No. All right. And I see Allison has joined us as well, um, which is great because we are going to move into our first topic for the night, which is updated uh, on the pool testing and additional Q&A, uh, which will also include... Um, we set aside a, a set block of time specifically for Q&A uh, with the goal of ending it um, no later than six o'clock so we can move on with the rest of the agenda. But I am going to turn it over to Allison Ouellette and Robin Sis for this uh, portion of the meeting. Hi, everybody. You unmute yourself, yep. Hey, Allison. Hi, I see people are coming on, but... Um... So Robin and I are your pool nurses. We haven't come up with a cute name yet, but <laughs> <laughs> of course, everybody I talk to thinks we're talking about the swimming pool or that we're testing the water that comes out of the sewer. So it's like, no, nope, no. Nope. <laughs> um, so just a quick, just a quick report. Um, as of now, we have 143 people signed up for testing which is pretty cool. Um, and it's a combination of employees and staff and students. Uh, and um, Robin and I have kind of divided our forces. I'll, I will be kind of keeping track of the Hopkins students and Robin will be keeping track of the elementary students. We plan to start tomorrow. Um, we're just working on the logistics. As you all know, the high school student, the high school schedule is fluid. Um, so we're trying to capture the perfect time for when we can come in for that. Um, our plan is to go from room to room, collect the samples, and then we ship them to the lab. And we expect to get the results pretty quick, 24 to 48 hours, which is what um, the other schools that we've talked to, every they've been getting it back less than 48 hours, but nobody confirmed less than 24. So, um, and that's really um, where we are right now. We're pretty excited about getting going. We think that this will be really helpful um, for us for the, for now, as well as for um, potentially the future as well. Robin, was there anything you wanted to add? Uh, hi there, everybody. Um, no, Allison, that was great. That was um, perfect. Um, I'll just reiterate a little bit of what Allison said that we're excited to get this um, asymptomatic testing underway for our um, staff, students, and community. And it seems like um, each week we have more and more um, participants. So just a reminder that it is an open enrollment. Um, so, you know, feel free to sign up at any time. Um, Allison and I, we check the um, company's website, Concentric, that we're um, doing our pool testing through and we're updating our list weekly. So um, if we, you know, happen, if you ended up signing up your child, say on the weekend, like a Saturday or Sunday, we'll do our best to include them on that Monday coming up. Um, but they might be added the week after, but we'll do our best to um, make sure that we're up to date and current as soon as we possibly can be. Yeah, I think another thing too is uh, we will routinely, our plan is to routinely test on Mondays. Um, we wanted to have this conversation with everybody before we started. So that's why we're starting on a Tuesday, but normally it'll be a Monday. And that, that helps with the contact tracing if we needed to. Um, um, hopefully, like I said, we'll, we'll hopefully we'll get the labs out right away as soon as we're done collecting. Um, the sooner we get them out, the sooner we get them back. 
I would just add something I learned today on a webinar that statewide what they've been seeing is less than one in 100 of pools are positive. So that's of pools. And they're say, seeing right now in the state less than two individuals. So when I say less than one in 100 at positive pool, the average pool size across the state is about seven. That can fluctuate. Um, so at less than one in 100, are testing positive now across the state, the entire pool, and less than two in 1,000 individuals are testing positive right now in school pool testing. Um, so it confirms some of what uh, we've, we've seen is that the mitigation strategies in school do seem to prevent COVID-19 transmission in schools. So I don't know if um, you guys had assembled some kind of frequently asked questions or updated questions. Is there anything in particular that you wanted to highlight here or did we want to open it up for questions from any of the public? I think um, one of the, well, one of the questions that um, I grilled my, my students, my children, if they had questions and um, one of the questions was, you know, how often is it going to be tested? And that's weekly. And another question that came up was, um, who does the test? Like who collects the sample? <laughs> so, and, uh, um, if you are able, you will collect your own sample. Uh, and if you need assistance, that's what we're there for. Those are the two burning questions from my, uh, my teenagers. So that's, that's the perspective they're coming from. So, um, yeah, is there anything that you think, uh, Robin, that you think out of that Q&A that is, you know, if your child um, is 18, they can sign themselves up? Yeah, um, I think when I talk to my boys about it, and I have a fifth grader and a kindergartner, they gave me thumbs up and said, oh, pretty cool, mom, all right. So, and then they kind of just forgot about it. Um, and so we, like Allison said, you know, we want to make this as natural and fluid as possible um, for the kids and, um, you know, uh, allay any fears that any children or families might have um, and allow this to be like a really seamless process. It's, it's um, is super easy. Um, it's great data that Annie just shared with us. Um, that's what we want to see. Uh, so as we move forward, come next year and our mitigations are still in place if they need to be, um, you know, we can go into the school year having some confidence in ourselves and knowing that, um, you know, the things that we're doing, we're, we're, we're doing them right. As far as the um, Q and A questions, um, I think that the handout is, um, is great. And if anybody, I'm ready for any public questions or comments. Allison, are you? Yeah. Okay, I'll first ask um, my fellow school committee members whether you all have any questions that you'd like to ask first. I have no questions. I'm really glad this is uh, getting off the ground. Thank you for leading this. All right, great. Yes, thank you. Um, so for public, um, this is not to replace public comment, but we had set aside uh, time up until six o'clock at the latest uh, to address questions that you may have, since we do have Robin and Allison here as resources that can answer those questions. So if you do have a question, please raise your digital hand. You should see that as an option uh, down at the bottom of your screen, possibly in the toolbar uh, or underneath the participants window. And uh, if you do raise your digital hand, then I can take you off mute and you can ask your question uh, regarding pooled testing. So I will pause and see if there are any digital hands going up. Here's one. Dan Woga, I am asking you to unmute and you should be able to speak now. Hi, I was wondering if all the students um, who signed up to do it, who are in the same classroom, is that one pool? That's a great question. The pools are, we're trying to keep them as small as possible. And we're also trying to divide up the staff between the pools so we don't have one pool full of all teachers. 
Uh, and so the way it's breaking down, and I can speak for Hopkins, is roughly the classroom will be a pool. Um, we're, you know, depending on the size of the number of children or number of students that are consented, how many kids are in the class versus uh, how many staff there are. So it's roughly five to seven people per pool in Hopkins at this time. Now that can all change. The pools can go up to 25. And I'll just piggyback a little bit off of what Allison had said. Um, so at the elementary school, it really all, it sort of depends on how many children in each class have consented. So if we have only say three students that consented in one fifth grade class, we'll probably, and two in the other fifth grade class, we'll combine them together as a pool because the pool needs to be at least um, five individuals and no less than five, no bigger than 25. But like Allison said, our, um, our goal is to keep it within the classroom, but that may not be possible. Um, so does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Thanks for the question. Any other questions? If so, please go ahead and raise your digital hand. I'm seeing none. So this Q&A document was very helpful. Uh, having you both available as resources has been just invaluable. We really do appreciate your time. Um, uh, seeing no questions or hands raised, I think we're good to move forward. Uh, unless there's anything else, Robin or Allison, you'd like to say about this topic before we close? I don't think so. I'm just, I'm really grateful that we have the opportunity to do this. And I think that we are gonna show the benefit of it and that other schools will see um, the information and the, and the um, confidence that this information will give us. So I'm, I'm grateful for Annie and uh, for the state and that we're all going to do it. So this is, this is good. Agreed. Thank you both. Appreciate it. Thanks. All right. We're going to move then into public comment. That is the next item on the agenda. Uh, just a reminder, public comment is uh, for you as public to comment on um, anything that is on the agenda, but we uh, may or may not uh, you know, be able to engage with you on that, but we would love to know your perspectives on our agenda topics before we do deliberate those as a committee. Um, we do try to limit public comment to three minutes each um, in case there are a number of people who want to make public comment. So at this time, uh, as we just did with the last one, if you would like to make com public comment, please go ahead and raise your digital hand and we'll make sure that you can come off of mute uh, and make your comment. Christine Cullen has a comment. I will ask you to unmute. Christine Cullen, you should be able to come off mute now. Okay, yes, thank you. Um, yes, we're happy to um, be looking forward to the school opening full days and with all of the students back. But one thing that I'm just thinking about with the seniors is the possibility that, um, you know, what will happen if seniors end up quarantined um, for their senior week and for graduation, you know, if a student were exposed in school. Um, during those last few weeks. And so I'm just wondering, you know, like for seniors who have been home most of the year, it will kind of be a shame for them to come back for a brief time and then possibly end up not being able to participate. So I don't know what a solution to this is, but I just wanted to bring this up as something to think about um, because there is this, it seems like a big shift at the end of April to classes changing, lunch, you know, full days. And I'm just hoping that that is not going to lead to students coming back and being exposed and then, you know, not being able to participate. So that was just my comment. Thank you, Christine. Appreciate it. I think um, we're right there with you. It would be a shame and we don't want to see that either. So I appreciate you bringing it up. Um, I think it is something that we'll have uh, in mind as we think about these plans, uh, graduation plans, all of that. Anyone else with public comment, please go ahead and uh, 
raise your digital hand. Okay, I'm seeing none. So I, um, I just wanna make sure there's no one in the waiting room and uh, then we will go ahead and move into our presentations and discussion items. And I, I do wanna just thank um, all of the public for being here. We've got a pretty full slate tonight of discussion items and a lot of exciting information. So with that, let's start with the final guidance person learning, Annie. Yes, so I just wanted to remind people, not only is there a link to this guidance in the agenda, but also I've included it in the weekly newsletter last week, I think the week before, as soon as it came out, I will include it again in the upcoming week. Um, but rather than spend time on the state's guidance, I think it makes sense to just move directly into each of the principals talking about what this is going to look like in their respective schools. And I think it makes sense to start with the elementary school with Principal Dowd, since our elementary students will be resuming full days, five days a week, and all hands on deck next Monday, a week, less than a week from today now, Ms. Dowd. So thank you, Dr. Up. McKenzie. I appreciate that. I'm going to share my screen. I did put a brief slideshow together just to highlight some of the major changes for Monday. Um, I did review and went over some of these topics with my fourth graders who also peppered me with wonderful questions. So I'll try to get through all of them um, for parents who are listening, families who are listening. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen. Let's see. Apologize. Do I have, can you guys see that? No. no. Oh boy. Of course. Annie, uh, you're muted if you're talking. Sorry. And I'm telling her her camera's not on. So my microphone was not on and your camera is on for some reason, Jen. Yeah, it's not allowing me to share my screen. Um, Are you a co-host? I am. So I should have capability. You might want to, maybe you, you might want to reboot and perhaps April get started. Yeah. Why don't we do that? Why don't we have April start? And if it doesn't work for you, Jen, you can send a, send me a link and um, I'll take, I'll share it on my end. Okay. Sorry about that. April, are you going to share your screen? Oh, now we're seeing Jen. Oh, screen. great. Here we go. Okay. Thanks. I got it. April, you're saved. I'll go first. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. For some we're reason, wasn't. The, we're seeing the Zoom uh, login screen. Hmm. And you're not seeing, you're not seeing my presentation? No, we're seeing, oh, now we are. Oh, great. There we go. All right. So um, just some major changes for starting Monday. The main ones that I would like to highlight is obviously that we're continuing and we're starting with um, our 825 and three o'clock dismissal. So all students will start dismissing at 255 to get them out the door by three o'clock. This obviously will start on Monday. Our next big change is that we are having lunches. So I'll go over briefly what that's gonna look like at Hadley Elementary School. And then we are having, which is the most exciting item I would say for our students is in-person specials. So art, music, PE and library. We're trying to get the library reopened, looking at guidance for checking out books and um, getting that space covered. So we will go on to the next one. This is our current data. So we surveyed families last week and the week before. We've been making phone calls and trying to get up-to-date numbers of who is coming back and who is going to be staying remote. Um, so our in-person students currently starting on Monday will be 232 students. That's 91% of students roughly um, from our total student body, which is 254, including pre-K. Our remote students that are choosing to stay remote will be 22 students students, and that's spread out throughout the grade levels, um, with actually the bulk of students being in our first, second, um, first and second grades. 
There are a few throughout the other grade levels, um, but we're really fortunate in that um, in looking at the student needs and looking at our remote students, we were originally going to have one remote teacher who was going to support synchronous live time with students. We were fortunate enough to um, reach out and ask Dr. McKenzie if we could ask, ask for one more remote teacher. And so now we have two remote teachers for our 22 students. I think this is going to be very helpful in um, giving some um, synchronous live time to our students who are remaining remote. They're going to work in consultation. The two remote teachers will work in consultation with the classroom teachers. The classroom teachers will still be the current teacher on record, but we'll be working as a team to support our remote students, making sure that they um, are able to connect with one another. And we'll also have the two remote teachers working together as a team. So if one were out, the other one can, can help out as well. So it's about creating consistency for our remote families and supports. Um, our two remote support personnel teachers are Jennifer Roman, who's been actually filling in for Josh Driver um, while he's been away. And so we're excited to have her and Cassie Stewart, who's very familiar with um, supporting students remotely. And so they've been working all week to create schedules and to um, get to know the students, reach out to the classroom teachers to schedule times where they can consult together as a group. And so we hope to have that all in place by Monday. Um, there will be adjustments to the schedule as we move forward, but um, I'm excited that we have two, two dedicated teachers to support the 22 students. Now it seems like 91% is a lot. We've only actually added nine students to our roster. We've been almost at this percent um, the entire time. And so um, while it seems like a lot of students, we've actually been operating pretty much close to this. It's only an addition of nine shows. Here's our in-person classroom um, information. And there's not much to change here. Um, we are going to continue all of our masks, social distancing, hygiene protocols, hand washing, hand washing routines. Um, obviously, we're going longer, so we'll embed those um, routines and practices for until three o'clock until we get them on the bus. We're continuing with our designated zones, our recess outside um, for our classrooms. They have their individual zones for mass breaks and for recess breaks. Um, and so that is not gonna change. Again, we're only adding nine students, but we did look at our longer day schedule. So we wanna plan out when the kids are having snack to make sure that it now coincides with lunch um, and so on and have extra recess. I did receive a very persuasive essay today on why we should have an extended recess for an hour um, from a wonderful fourth grade student. And I'm looking into that. So, um, but as of right now, we're maintaining the 30 minute recess mark, um, unless I get more essays, which I'm sure I probably will. Um, instruction will now happen between three and six feet masked. Six feet will happen distance um, for eating. So snack, and lunch, there's actually only one grade level which we would not be able to have lunches um, in the classroom. So all classrooms actually are six feet apart right now, except for one grade level, which is fifth grade. And so fifth grade is the only grade level that has to access the cafeteria to maintain the social distancing of six feet while eating. So we've already measured all of that out. The rest of the classrooms are able to eat in, I'm sorry, the rest of the um, classes are able, able to eat by six feet in their classrooms. And so we've created a schedule that will allow teachers to um, make sure that they're watching the students while they're eating, um, and then they'll go out for recess. So we've worked really hard to make sure that the plan works. The cafeteria will be accessed, but only by that larger group of students for fifth grade because they can't be six feet apart. They're actually, one of the classrooms is just under um, five feet um, for, for distancing. And so they'll continue to maintain um, distancing while learning, but the fifth grade is the only one that needs to be in the cafeteria right now. Our lunches, our lunches, this is something I wanted to highlight to families. Diane Zach has worked extremely hard um, with the state and organizing lunches. We're gonna start on Monday. Um, we sent a survey out to families. We hadn't gotten 100% participation, which we really are hoping for, um, but it's really important that families know that 
school lunches, the brown bag lunches that we're going to be serving students are at no cost to families. And that's for everyone. So if you want your child to have a bagged lunch, it's it they will not be charged. Um, and that goes for every student. And so we're going to continue that for the school year. And I think that's a great service. Um, we have sent out the survey. The deadline is already passed. So if you are interested in having a um, bagged lunch for your child, you need to contact Diane Zach and we can make sure that we facilitate that. So that's a great resource for families. All lunches will be in the classroom, like I mentioned, um, except for fifth grade. The lunches will be delivered to the classroom so they can sit and eat in their rooms, take their masks off, and then they will go outside for recess. And this is a lot of coordinating and we are the first school to go through this. So we are working, we're gonna be working out the kinks as we go forward, um, but the staff and everyone is committed to making sure that we get lunches happening on time so students get fed. Next um, item is in-person special. So I had a specials meeting with the specialist teachers today. Um, and they were very adamant that they also want to maintain a connection with the remote students. So they're going to be working as a team to upload um, asynchronous activities for art, music, and PE for the remote families. Um, and they, of course, will still be grading work as they've been doing. But they are also very excited to get started in having in-person specials. Um, this has been challenging for for. Um, the art, music, and PE teachers to be very creative in supplying lessons. And so they're looking forward to having some students in front of them. So all in-person students will have one special per day on a rotating three-day schedule. Uh, music is going to hold off on any lessons pertaining to singing because the guidance around singing was still very strict. And um, there are other things that we'll, we feel confident we'll be able to do with the students. So we're going to hold off on singing for right now. Um, and the remote students will have special specials activities, like I mentioned, um, and they will work. Um, they will work with the remote students on collecting work and grading. Arrival and dismissal. So again, it's really only affects the nine nine kiddos that are coming back. Um, arrival and dismissal is going to be exactly the same. It's just going to be later on in the day. So we still have three entrances when kids get dropped off in the morning. They have the front door, the east wing, and the gym door. That's actually going to be changed to the cafeteria door because now we're going to have in-person PE and Coach Catania has to get ready for his lessons. So that's one tweak we made today. Um, and dismissal is just going to continue to also be out those doors. Um, but at the traditional time of 2.55, and we'll start doing that in a staggered way. And all changes to transportation, we still continue to ask families that they clear it by the main office no later than 11 o'clock. That just allows us to prepare and get students where they need to be. A lot of plans have gone into place for arrival and dismissal, as you know. And so parent drop-off, um, we're measured out to the T. And so it's any disruption to that, it's always helpful to get that information in advance to the staff. And that's all that I have. I will take any questions that anybody has. I know it's a lot of information. We are the first ones to kind of go through this. And so we're excited to um, see how it goes and, and start with full days. It's been a lot of planning and I couldn't be more happy with the staff and proud of all the work that we've done. Um, and so I, I do want to say thank you to my staff and thank you to everybody for helping me put yet another plan together. Thanks, John. Yep. So I will ask, are there any questions from the committee? Jen, thanks for the good presentation. Just quickly, what's, what's the um, most difficult aspect here? What gives you the biggest cause for concern? Uh, really, I have to say nothing. Um, to be honest with you, <laughs> we're really just excited for this next phase. We've done this before. Um, you know, it's it's longer days. I think if anything, the kids might be a little tired. Um, I'm sure we might all be a little tired. Um, but again, that's nothing new. And I, I'm just looking forward to having the students experience a traditional day. And so um, 
you know, arrival dismissal, we've already problem solved around that. Again, it's only an addition of nine students. So it's, it's, we're already working at full capacity. Um, I think the remote teacher, having two remote teachers is an asset. Um, it's going to be extremely helpful to have those teachers take on the responsibility of coordinating time um, instead of the teacher's trying to do double duty. That's been a lot of work and a lot of planning. Um, so I'm excited for this. I wanna finish this year strong. A um, couple months ago, I just wanted to finish. So um, I think now it's, it's more of a positive outlook and I'm excited about the next, the next phase. That's great, hey, we're excited for you. We're all yeah. supporting you. I had one quick question. Sure. Um, in the event, and I, I'm, hoping and hopeful that we won't need to, but if a class needs to quarantine um, due to exposure, um, what will be the plan for students when they are remote? Be so that's, a, that's an excellent question, Tara. So we have given a lot of thought about um, what would we want to do? What would be least disruptive to our remote students? If they're already in um, kind of this momentum with a new schedule. The last thing we would want to do is interrupt that. However, we would like to provide some opportunities for them to see their classmates. And so I think it's going to be a balance of making sure that we don't disrupt the remote learners with their schedule. And if a class has to quarantine, obviously everybody will be remote. And so the classroom teacher might be able to provide some opportunities for everybody to get in the virtual space. For instance, like a morning meeting, everybody can participate in a morning meeting. It's about um, community and seeing one another. Um, if it's more um, a specialized service like reading services and they're already in a routine with the remote teachers, they would probably want to stay that way. The remote teachers are also going to upload assignments. And so the last thing we would want to do is confuse our remote learners and then give them additional assignments. Um, and so I think a lot of it is going to be timing um, and opportunity. So we'll have to see how far along we are if we need to go in a closure. We've done it already this year. We were unfortunately we had to close down a couple classrooms and send some kiddos home. And I think we were successful in, in maintaining the connection with the students while that happened. Um, I'd love to say that's never going to happen again, but I'm a realist. And so we do plan for those things. So I hope that answered your question. Thank you. Yeah, great question, Tara. Yeah, it has come up and, and each grade level is going to look a little different too. Um, some kids can can jump right on, you know, the upper grades um, and and you know, connect with their classroom teachers. They're still going to have connection with their classroom teachers. They're still available by email. Um, we're still going to hold parent conferences if there's a concern. And so a lot of this has to just do with communication and making sure that we have, um, you know, the ability to just navigate our way through things that pop up. And unfortunately, quarantine is one of them. Okay. Any other questions before we move to uh, April and Hopkins? I have a quick question and that is, um, I, this it's highly uh, unlikely, uh, um, but just to imagine a scenario, if numbers uh, at large were to go back up, um, mm -hmm. what, what, is, what are the uh, implications, Annie? So, Humara, I want to make sure I understand the question you're asking. Uh, what are the implications in terms of making, under what conditions would we make a decision to change the instructional model? Is that what you're asking? Right. Uh, now, with the new regulations, we can only, we cannot unilaterally change the instructional model. We would have to communicate with the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Um, they have indicated that they certainly are paying attention to the possibility that um, should be unfortunate, hopefully this doesn't happen, that health data demand a different kind of instructional model across the state. But right now it isn't something that we would be determining. Uh, if we made that decision to determine that we would end up out of compliance with time and learning regulations, we'd have to make up that time uh, on the back end um, and or risk the town uh, losing for every day that we opted for an instructional model that was not in-person learning without the express 
permission of the state, uh, we also run the risk of for each one of those days, the town losing one one eightieth of its chapter 70 funding in the next fiscal year. We want to definitely wouldn't want to do that. Um, is that an instance where, uh, is this what I'm, I'm seeing other towns around the state ask for a waiver? Um, if, I mean, again, unlikely, but if it were to um, trend in that direction and um, exceed thresholds that we had previously determined um, to be um, reasonable, is that, is, that what, is that the course of action we would be taking? Certainly, the waiver is primarily designed for schools who are not in any way able at this point in time. They don't have adequate staff. They can't bring students back. That's the primary purpose of the waiver. The waiver is not meant to, um, to be kind of the way in which individual communities make determinations about healthcare data. DESE, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education and Department of Public Health will work together to make determinations about regions and about communities, but we can always ask. I just don't want the public to hear that um, that, that was the intent of the waiver or that it is, it's likely, um, but we can always ask for a waiver. Right. And it's my expectation that the Department of Public Health the Department of Elementary and Secondary Ed will also work with health officials across the state. And if they need to change their course of action, that they will do that. Great. Again, highly unlikely, but important for us to know what our responsibilities are. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Any other questions on the elementary school plans? Okay. April. Back to you for the Hopkins Academy plans. Thanks. I'm gonna try to screen share, which hopefully is not an issue on my end. We see your you presentation. Talk. Yep. Okay. All right. So at Hopkins, of course, we have some things that are similar to Hadley Elementary. But there are, are some differences in our basic structure. And we, of course, as Jen noted, have the luxury of a little extra time as well in order to uh, see at least how lunch goes over at the elementary school. So the big picture is that we have full days. Students are moving through all classes every day. It includes lunch. Um, and essentially, minus some protocols, it is mostly business as usual. So one thing I did want to mention as we have our survey out right now about who's returning is just a reminder that families do have to make a decision about their return for a four week period. What we've been getting a lot of this year is students saying that they're going to return and then not returning or bouncing in and out. And that of course impacts where classrooms can be held because they're all based on very specific numbers and having to adjust to that can be quite complicated. So we are asking that families do commit for a four week period and then they have an opportunity to return in that second four week period if they elect not to in the first one. Additionally, if a student says that they're going to return and they do not return for a week, of course, barring something like a, a medical exemption or something that they've already communicated to the school, then we will remove them to remote status instead. Again, for the same reasons that I just noted. Our drop-off is the same. So by the main office door for parent drop-offs and bus and student drivers are by the cafeteria. I supervise over by the cafeteria and Ms. Sierra supervises by the main office. This is an example schedule, which I know may or may not <laughs> make a lot of sense to everybody. So I will just highlight about it quickly. What's important to note is really just the times, I guess, for now. You don't have to worry about memorizing our waterfall schedule. In any way, we are switching these blocks back in the middle, for those of you who do know about it. FG and HI, we had flip-flopped early on in the year due to some survey results. Because of the complexities of lunch and shared staff, we have to put it back. Otherwise, we do not have enough staff to supervise lunch. The other thing to note is that we still have our two mask breaks. And then of course, the day goes until two, it still starts at 740. Because we do have to have that period of time in the morning with supervision. 
students are still going to go directly instead of to their cohort, they'll go to their first period class. And so they'll be in there with their teachers rather than the cafeteria as we used to. And then this is the middle school one. It's very similar. These times here around lunch and HI are just a little bit different. So we still have a middle school and a high school lunch. The classrooms themselves are all at three feet or more. I have a, a very complicated list that I can answer specific questions if it's helpful about who's in what room. But essentially what's important to know is that we do have 43% of our classes that are still at six feet or more. And we have 57% that are somewhere between three and six feet. The majority of teachers are able to stay in their rooms. This is helpful for a lot of them. Many teachers have specific technology in their rooms. Our science teachers in particular have really worked hard to stay in their rooms for their lab abilities. Um, and we have sufficient space. So as Annie indicated before, there are some schools that just do not, but we can fit everybody that we need to fit and move them through all of those classes. Lunch for me was the slightly complicated part of things. So lunch will be taken daily through school brains. It will either be picked up or dropped off. Again, some of this will be influenced by how things go at the elementary school. Diane, Zach, and I have a meeting at the end of next week in order to talk about how that's going and then tweak anything we need to on our end before it begins. For example, our students are all going to be eating lunch outside, so it might end up making more sense on most days to have them pick it up rather than have it dropped off to the rooms. They also move their locations daily, so that also gets complicated in terms of tracking where the students are for lunch. They're not always in that one grade level space. So in general, they're going to eat outside. We did purchase blankets for every single student so that they have something to sit on outside and staff member who's supervising them. On rainy days, they will be in classrooms, the cafeteria and the gym. In both scenarios, they're sitting by grade level. So when they're inside on a rainy day, they'll have a specific kind of like the cohort group that they have lunch with at six feet apart. And when they're outside, they're going to sit by larger grade level, kind of like they do when there's a fire drill and they have different sections of the grass that they go out to. The blankets are nicely almost six feet apart. So when they open those and spread those out, they'll just about be as far away as we want them from one another. And Ms. Fogarty has kindly written out directions with visuals to help students learn how to fold those back up. They have like a nice little handle and we're getting a marker so that they can write their names on them. So they'll each have one of those. Our seniors, as their one senior privilege, I wish I could give them more, but you know, kind of is what it is this year. They can have permission to leave campus. They just have to fill out a permission slip for that and have their parent signature. Then they bring that back in or email it in and I sign off on that. And again, in all situations, they are six feet apart or more if they're outside. We have plenty of space when they're outside for lunch. Our dismissal is also the same as it is right now, except a little bit later. So we're already doing a staggered dismissal. I guess this, this was the other thing seniors did ask for. I was dismissing them last because in my head it was, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten. So they kindly asked if they could be dismissed first as a part of a small privilege. So they get dismissed first and then grades nine and ten and then seven and eight. And again, they go out the same way that they come in, either, you know, the cafeteria for the bus or their own car or out front by the main office if they're being picked up. In terms of instruction, all of the teachers are gonna to continue to use Google Classroom. So those classrooms will still have lesson plans. They will be explicit for students who are remote in terms of the instruction, the materials and the resources will still be found there. Attendance might look a little bit different. So right now everyone's logging in all of the time at the beginning of a class and having that attendance taken. In that last period of time, teachers will have the option of either continuing to do that or backtracking attendance and have students' asynchronous participation count as attendance instead. And some of that will depend on, as it always does, the teacher, the subject, the grade level, the lesson that day. So there's going to be different factors that kind of weigh into the attendance piece. Right now, teachers are seeing an average loss of about 10 minutes of class time in terms of movement, attendance, and uh, cleaning the desks. So again, some of them might end up doing some of that more asynchronously for our remote students. Students will also still continue to see their instruction vary. 
So it is likely that they still might have some synchronous instruction at times, but it's also very possible they might see more asynchronous instruction than they previously did. The majority of our school year students have been remote, even when they're in person, right? They've been remote until a couple of weeks ago. And so now we're sort of making a, a swap on that. And the remote students are probably gonna see a little more asynchronous instruction. That being said, there are teachers that are doing things like using their document camera, which can be projected both in the classroom and projected at home for the remote students. So those things will continue to change based on all of the same factors that we've already discussed. We do expect though that if students are choosing to stay remote, that they are committing to being independent learners who are capable of following those instructions and seeking help as needed. That is really, really important. I will talk um, in a minute, if that's okay, about the survey that I took for our students in phase three so far. And a lot of students did note that when they returned to in-person, they could focus better and had less distractions. That's of course not true for everyone. Some students have great focus at home, but uh, some maybe are a little bit better off in person for that. And if they are choosing to stay remote, they have to be committed to having those skills if they're going to be remote learners. So that being said, that's the majority of the changes for us. I think the, the really big change is that they're going to go through all of their classes all of the time. Right now, we were working up to that where we would have hit that probably by the end of the year, but we're in a place right now where they're going through three classes, technically four because H and I are actually two different class periods we were going to continue to build. So what we'll see on April 26 is not a middle school week and a high school week, but everybody there at once moving through their classes and going through all of those classes all at once. So we do have a lot of complicated schedules around that and room assignments and all sorts of good things. And so I am very thankful to the reentry team that has continued to work with me on that and to the staff and my other administrators on that as well. So if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer those. April, a quick question about lunch. Um, Jen had mentioned that at the elementary school, lunch is available at no charge for students. Is that the same for Hopkins as well? Yep, that's been the district all year. And I believe, Annie, you might remember better, Diane Zach said that extends through, it's a weird time next year. I think it's through October or something of next year. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. I have two questions. Sure. Um, one is for you, April, and the other one might be more... Um, for Annie. Um, the first one is, as students are moving from classroom to classroom, um, what will the um, procedure be for hand hygiene and whatnot? So when they go to a new classroom, they enter that classroom and it, it can depend. Some of our classrooms have sinks. So for classrooms that have sinks, the teachers sometimes have them wash their hands instead. If they don't, then they all have hand sanitizer and they hand sanitize. They also clean the desks either on the way in or the way out. We had said sort of a flat rule, everyone was gonna do that on the way in, but teachers have sort of decided whatever time-wise gets them the most instructional time to do that on either end for themselves. Okay, thank you. Um, the other question that I had was really, you know, uh, and maybe there's more information that I'm unaware of from the last time I, I read the, the guidance. So I know that there's this kind of tiered approach that the elementary school is starting, then the middle school, then the high school, there'll be further guidance at a later date. Um, and so the elementary school makes sense to me. The middle school can look different depending on which district you're in, right? So what is the rationale behind waiting on announcing plans for the high school? It's my understanding, Heather, and I, sorry, Tara, and I could be, I could be mistaken with this, but that we are not going to expect additional guidance, just a date. And so the, the guidance was, it was essentially had more to do with what was considered manageable for districts. And we, really, as, as April pointed out, for two thirds of the year, instruction, instruction, not support, but instruction in grades seven through 12 has been remote, two thirds to almost three quarters of the year. We couldn't come up with a compelling reason as to why we would continue to have high school students wait 
for additional in-person instruction. And again, the guidance is going to, all of the guidance will remain the same. Distancing will remain the same. Everything CDC has updated. It's just a question of a date. Um, we could do it. Um, so we couldn't come up with a reason as to why we would make families wait for that or students for that matter. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, as far as we go as a district, mm -hmm. I was just curious what the rationale was behind it, but that makes sense. And then I, I didn't read anything when I read it. I know that the CDC had uh, so much guidance lately. Maybe I'm outdated now in my mm -hmm. thought process, but I'm just curious if there was any um, recommendations or guidance around whether or not cohorting is still considered a best practice. And the reason I ask this in the high school level and not the elementary school level is, is obvious, I think. So it's always, nobody stops saying that that of course is the gold standard, but the message now is that this should not, cohorts, if you can cohort and you can provide in-person instruction, which is what happens at elementary schools relatively easily, um, then where you can, you should do that. But cohorting, and especially given the, the data that we have around transmission in schools, even with pool testing here now in the state, that keeping students in cohorts, if that prevents them from experiencing face-to-face -face instruction, which we've seen our data indicate that in the aggregate, doesn't mean this is true for everyone, but our data clearly demonstrate in the aggregate that remote instruction is not working as well as face-to-face -face instruction based on some of the data that we've reviewed with the school committee around number of course failures per student and increase in failures overall, as well as students reporting on their experience of remote instruction. And so um, cohorting still wherever possible, but the message has been from the Massachusetts Association of of pediatricians from, um, and from the state that that should not prevent students from being able to access face-to-face -face instruction. I have two more questions, I'm sorry. Sure. Um, I know you may not know the exact numbers off the top of your head, but mm -hmm. I should have all the numbers for you. <laughs> <laughs> she came prepared. Prepared this time. <laughs> Um, so, okay, so one of them is about pool testing and one of them is for you, April. So based on the guidance that came out, April, um, what percentage of students do we have coming back? What, per, you know, that decided to come back in person versus stay remote? Sure. So our survey is still out in, and being collected currently. Families have until Friday to complete that. So right now we have 102 students who are remote. Of those, 53 have responded and of those 36 plan on returning and 17 plan on staying remote. So if we add those 36 to our current numbers, we would have 186 or 74% of the school being in person if we didn't add any more. I would guess we're probably gonna end up around 200, maybe a little bit over that. And I would say that what we're still getting the majority of are students that do not want even an hour of the cohort model so some said they were going to come back in phase three and then chose to stay remote and will return in that last phase when they're going through every class all day. So we will see an increase in those numbers by a little bit. And then some, of course, will will choose to stay remote. So even though it's different, that's still fairly incremental. So really it is. That's good to know. And then um, the other question they had was based on what Allison and um, Robin had reported about, and I forget the number now, just numbers are going through my head now. Um, the number of families that signed up, let me, people, let me rephrase that to people because it could be students and or staff signed up for pooled testing. What percentage of that is staff? And then further broken down, how many people at the high school um, percentage wise, I'm not asking for, you know, any definitive information that would be revealing, but um, percentage-wise at the high school versus percentage-wise at the elementary school. Do we have a rough idea? I, so I can tell you um, perhaps while either during the business manager reports, not that I'm not hanging on everything that you say, Chris, but I can, I'm in my office, so I can turn to my other computer screen 
and we have a Google sheet with the information I can filter by building and filter by role. And I can report that back out at the end. Thank you. I just think it would be interesting to know um, on the high school level, that's going to be the elementary school. It's not a drastic change, um, mm -hmm. you know, for them, but I'm just, you know, it's a, it's a big change in the high school. So I'm hoping that we've got a good portion of students um, and staff who are willing to do the pool testing or eventually again, sign up for it, given, given the big changes, because that can only help us. So thank you. Sure. And now that the weather's getting nicer, what is there guidance on ventilation, opening the windows? So that guidance, that guidance really hasn't changed. That opening the windows is always the best practice. You yeah. get uh, significantly greater air exchange rates, even just by opening the windows just a bit. We do encourage teachers to open the windows, even, even throughout the winter, we ask them to keep the windows cracked open. Um, and mm -hmm. this was because that is highly recommended in terms of getting air ventilation and we, we do have the oil bills to prove it. Um, okay. So that will continue. And thankfully now the weather is, uh, is much nicer. Yeah. And lunch too, as I said, will be outside unless I call it otherwise. So individual teachers won't be making that decision. I'll call it only if it's raining on them. Other than that, they can put on a jacket and, and go outside and Hopefully they remember, although I will say teenagers aren't always good about being dressed appropriately for the weather, but they seem to handle it okay-ish, I guess. But uh, hopefully they at least maybe leave something behind in a, in a classroom so that they have it, but they will be outside eating hopefully every day. I guess we'll see how much rain we get at the, the end of April and into May. I like the blanket idea. Hopefully yeah. that works. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, We'll see how it goes. Hopefully middle schoolers aren't too messy with their blankets, but they are picnic blankets. So they have like a, a nice bottom. So if the ground's a little wet, they won't just be sitting in like a soppy blanket and they fold up. And so we'll see how it goes. Nice. A April as the, as the new guy, I guess I'm not as new anymore, but as the new guy, can I just get a, an explanation of the, the, what the seniors get in terms of being able to leave campus? <laughs> sure. So that, uh, I guess for the most part is the same as it always is. They get to sign out for lunch and then they sign back in. If they are tardy signing back in frequently, then they lose that privilege and they aren't able to do that. In a usual year, seniors have a couple other privileges. There aren't a ton associated with it, but things like they can work independently in the senior hallway normally. They usually have to meet a certain grade requirement in order to have that and an attendance requirement in order to have that. But we've waived those requirements for this year and they can just, if they get their parental permission, uh, sign out instead. So they're gone for that half hour and then they return afterwards. Is, is this, it can, I, I'm sorry, I really don't know what, what you guys do. Is this, they can, they can get in their cars and leave or yep. walk or if they, is there going to be kind of an expectation if people drive together that they're wearing masks? I'm just, I'm referencing kind of the public comment earlier about kind of seniors and that, that idea of like losing out on something because of, of having to quarantine. Yes, so absolutely. Although I will say that there are certain students that do already, usually more families that I think I can see as they come into the into the driveway that do travel together. I know mm -hmm. there are some students that are in each other's uh, a bubble, I guess, who spend some time together. And in relation to your the other point there about seniors, Ms. Lord and I did talk about that today. Their their class advisor, and she will be emphasizing, and I will be re-emphasizing next week and tonight that they really should take that pretty seriously at least a couple weeks before. Otherwise they might end up losing a, a multitude of events if they're out socializing together without masks on. So hopefully they make a good choice around that. Any other questions? No. Heather, I don't know if this would be a good time too for me to share the, the phase three survey from students that I have before we move on to the next topic. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay, I can screen share that. It's not very long. I just wanted to share 
I surveyed the students. We had only 57 responses, the majority from in-person students. And this just goes to the, the grades that responded to that. Our younger students seem to be really interested in completing surveys, which I guess is good. They've been the last couple ones just jumping right on those. They were some of the ones, the eighth and ninth graders, who immediately responded to the survey I sent out about our Zoom sessions with the WB Du Bois Center as well. So in terms of, we asked just a couple questions. So we wanted to know how satisfied they were with their learning. The results are not so bad, right? So we have over, or just about over 60% of students who are satisfied or very satisfied. I think that in general, in this, this time of year, even in a non-COVID year, um, that's probably decent data, but considering everything, I think that's okay. Same thing with being motivated. We saw over 50% of students are still feeling motivated. And this does tend to be the time of year where students kind of start to, to lose some of that. So hopefully being in person and coming back in person for some of them will freshen up some of that. And so we did see that in our other questions. So we asked about what changed the most and so, of course, they said things like having interactive classes, seeing their friends, being hands on, that it was fun and that they did have more attention and focus for remote students. They said that they saw more lateness. And so, again, that goes back to what I said about the length of time that it takes. And so teachers, again, might decide I don't need my remote students waiting around for 10 minutes while I get set up. They might decide to restructure that time differently and maybe do a check in with them at a later time rather than at the start and some shift in attention for those remote learners when students are in person. I asked what they liked about phase three. Our in-person students said that they liked seeing their friends, access to teachers, moving around, several mentioned liking movement, being engaged with their teachers and peers. They were happier. They had a better understanding of the material. They liked just being at school and PE and athletics, and of course, getting off of the computer. Some also really liked having a routine and leaving their house. And remote students liked the option to stay remote. And what was challenging, of course, a lot of these make sense of remembering the new protocols. You know, there's certain stairs they can go up and certain stairs they go down and other things like that around the building. There's some challenging spaces. Our gym is a little bit chilly in the winter and we have had a cohort in there. Hopefully that will warm up soon. Getting used to the schedule and finding their classes. Again, a lot of those classes right now, especially because they're six feet apart, move to different rooms than they're used to. So making sure they can keep track of that, knowing which cohorts they're in, especially after an off week. Though I will say the students today did pretty well in, in knowing where those were, so that was nice to see. And I'm always there on Monday with the list for any students who don't know where they're going. So I am there to check in with them as well. Some didn't like that they could no longer just mute distractions, which I thought was funny, but also a good, a good point. Getting back into the groove of things, they don't like the off weeks because they like the face-to-face. -face. Managing workload and homework can be a challenge, staying motivated, and several said nothing, that nothing was challenging. So just a little feedback for now as we continue to think about our final phase, right, it's just an increase of this. So having some of that information and continuing to collect more of that over the next few weeks, I think will really help teachers to prepare for that last round and how that should be structured and what it should look like. Thank you, that's great feedback from the students. Appreciate seeing that. And is that survey that's still open? You're trying to get more responses, April, or is that closed? It is still open, yeah. So I'll, I'll run it again and see what else we get from that um, and go from okay. there. Okay. And then the other survey that you mentioned, did that just go out to families whose kids are not in person right now in phase three? Correct, yes. So it was only sent to those who are currently remote, which is why perhaps people who have students are in person don't know what I'm talking about. Yes, it only went out to those who have students who are currently remote. And then we'll send out some general reminders to, to all the families in a little bit as well as to what's happening and what things look like. The okay. assumption is if they're currently in person, they're staying in person. Right. Any other questions? I just have, here I have your numbers. So we have uh, 143 people who've currently signed up for pool testing. Of those at Hopkins Academy, 60 people have signed up for pool testing, 41 students, 19 staff. Based on the estimate that April has, student-wise, that would be about 22% of the student body based on our estimate of roughly 200 ultimately um, being back. At HES, 
78 total, 57 students or 25% of the 232 in-person learners who will be at HES, 21 staff. Uh, staff altogether um, is 45 staff altogether across the district. So about 40% of employees in the district have signed up for pool testing. Thank you. Thanks, Annie. All right, April, anything else on that topic? I don't think so, but I'm happy to answer any other questions now or later. And I will be talking about it again next week um, on chatting with Camuso as well. Oh, great. Excellent. Well, thank you. Yeah, we're uh, uh, excited for both of these plans and moving forward. So thank you for laying them out so detailed. Uh, I don't still understand the block schedule and all the letters, but I, I know you do. Um, okay, and then that moves us into the DESE guidance for graduation. Uh, both yeah. April, yeah. you're covering that. <laughs> uh, April, well, April will be speaking to the planning that she and her team have been doing. Just before we start that, the link to the guidance was, I'm not going to go over the guidance with folks because what matters is what we're doing for graduation. Um, but the guidance is linked in the agenda for families or members of the public who would like to see that. Remember our agendas are always in the same place where you find the superintendent messages and that link to those folders is included in the weekly newsletter. And I know all the school committee has, has uh, thanked the principals. I do just wanna underscore the principals, the reopening team, some members of the teams like Michelle Wotowitz, Becky Jelinas, our head teachers, Jess Parker, Jason Burns, Brianna Lynch, Marion Gladstone, our school nurses, a lot of people. They make it look easy with 10 slides on a PowerPoint. Uh, and I know you all appreciate this. This is an incredible amount of work that these folks have done to pay attention to these details to the, to, in, the, in the manner in which they have and the care and seriousness with which they approach keeping our students and our families safe is just nothing short of, um, well, it leaves me speechless. I really mean that. And we are in a much, much better place than many districts. And that is entirely, entirely because of our faculty, because of our staff, because of these two building principles. I mean, this is a lot. It's a lot more than 20 slides. And I am deeply appreciative of everyone in the district for working together and helping. Deeply appreciative of the school committee for sticking by us and with us as we try to get through all these details. But I just really wanted to, uh, to say what I know also the school committee, you've already expressed it, I wanted to express it. And now uh, on to yet another set of plans with chalk and tape and blankets and I don't know what else. So Ms. Camuso, graduation. Sure, thanks. I'm just going to screen share one more time. It's not a very exciting document, but it has some information. I did send this out to students today. So I just wanted to give you sort of general overview around senior events. So those happen between May 21st and May 28th. They include things like a senior breakfast, senior send off photos by Jamie Beth Photography. They're donating uh, their time to that again this year. An HES walkthrough, a senior trip, a banquet, rehearsals, seminars, decorating, speech writing, class night preparation, and of course, class night. So they are doing the majority of the usual events. Some of those look a little bit different than usual, but most of them don't look that different than usual necessarily. Um, one of the things that we're still sorting out some details around will be class night more specifically. So families and students will get some more information around what that one might look like. I have some information about graduation for now. Essentially, we're doing whatever the guidance says around graduation. And if you want a shorter version of that, I will be sharing this document with people and this goes through the highlights of those. Our graduation will be outside. So it's outside on the 28th from four to 6 p.m. with a rain date on June 5th. Hasn't rained in several years, so hopefully it won't rain this year, that is our goal. And a sprinkle does not count as rain to me. I'm not canceling for a, a sprinkle. We live in New England, we can we can make do with a little tiny bit of rain, but not a, not a downpour, I'm not crazy. So we'll be in, especially for this reason, because it will be in the varsity baseball field. So we'll be out for those of you who, uh, maybe just Paul on this call, have an idea of what that looks like right now compared to the new grass is that it essentially creates 
a bit of an L. And so it'll be in that corner of the outfield. There'll be a stage and then families will have plenty of room to be set up in their sort of separate pods for graduation. The attend attendees can only be faculty, administration, speakers, graduates, and guests. Graduates per family can have up to six guests. And I, I say that because we do have some graduates who are twins. And so it's per family. Those students don't necessarily get twice as many students as or twice as many guests as everyone else. So you get up to six of those guests all have to be registered ahead of time and they have to complete these things that you see here. The screening for COVID and an agreement to notify us if they are symptomatic or exposed and to not attend as well if those things happen. So families will get a registration that will give them an opportunity to go through all of that. And so if they're not registered, they may not attend. I will remind people to register a couple of times if needed, if I'm, if I'm missing anyone. The families will sit six to 10 feet apart. We do have plenty of space, but within their bubble, they can be right next to each other. So we'll have chairs set up for them in those spaces. The graduates will either sit six feet apart from one another at the front of the stage, not on it, but at the front or with their family. We will work out that last detail as that gets closer with some input from the students and they may walk across the stage to pick up a diploma. So we do have a short stage that will give them some height, but that they should not fall off of as it's out in the field so that they can walk across. They can pick up their diploma from a table and then walk down on the other side. That's also where the podium will be and where we will have speeches. Has to be supervised. There has to be a reception area with a check-in for all of those who are registered and staff will also supervise the entrances or exits, uh, which is you guys know are a little bit larger since it's outside, but we will have arrows and directions and signage around that. Everyone must wear masks all of the time. So even those outside, masks have to stay on for everyone. The only people who can take their masks off are graduates when they're in a designated photography area, and that's it. The rest of the time, graduates have to keep their masks on as well. There's no food and no drink, and as I said, we will provide some signage for pathways and protocols and access to hand sanitizer. We will have the band, a smaller version of it. The performers have to be 10 feet apart. They have to be 25 feet from the audience and they will not be singing. We will then use a sound system for the recessional and for the speeches as well. I have this note in here about prom, mostly for the seniors, but you guys might care as well that we still don't have any guidance for this, but we are reviewing it based on the current state guidance and the venues guidance, which might look like a senior junior prom. So I'm in conversations with Ms. Duncan about that, and I'm hopeful that we'll have more information soon regarding prom. And then of course, my reminder to seniors, which is that it is important to follow the protocols and to not socialize a whole bunch outside of school because if they do and if they transmit to one another or have an exposure, as you can see, there are going to be many events and periods of time where they're together and they want to celebrate in different ways. And we don't wanna to have to quarantine or completely put a pause or an end to any of those things. So I will be emphasizing that with them a few times. The other thing I will emphasize here and probably another 10 times will be that they will not be for any reason on school campus or in the school building unsupervised for a prank or otherwise, or that will also result in a loss of some of those activities that they do wanna participate in. We can't have students running around the school unsupervised for a senior prank. So I will repeat all of that to our dear seniors as well, and hopefully parents will help to reinforce that. April, thanks for that. A quick question on one of the um, bullets that you had about sure. attendees and the six um, uh, family members that guests that could come. Yep. You mentioned COVID screening. I'm assuming that's like a self-reported questionnaire. Yep. We'll okay. use. Uh, I haven't talked to haven't talked to Annie about this yet, but my my thought is that we'll use the one we already have as a district, and that we will just add that into the registration process since we have one that already exists. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? I don't have any questions. I just have a comment. I just think that um, 
someone outside of April to emphasize, please do everything you can to be safe up until then, because I think it's absolutely amazing um, that students are going to have as close as really allowable um, to a normal graduation. This is already um, immensely more than we were able to do last year. Um, and, you know, Hopkins did everything to make it as special as possible under really trying circumstances last year. But this year, it's really you know, knock on wood, a really great opportunity to have something that's as normal and, a, you know, as meaningful as it can be. So I hope that kids are mindful of that and remain vigilant. And I'm really excited for the kids and families to be able to enjoy that experience this year. So I cross my fingers that everything works out the way that it should. The only other question I had um, was, I don't think you mentioned it. Heather had brought up, somebody had brought up last time of doing the um, car parade again. Is that something that they're talking about? No. So we actually ended the car parade a few years ago. The car parade was something that was done for several years, uh, but it wasn't uh, necessarily one of our more positive traditions. It has some challenges and involves students driving up to Smith Academy. So in place of that, Brian had put in the field day against Smith Academy instead to have a more supervised positive recreational activity between the two schools that will not be happening this year because of COVID. I've already spoken to that principal. I think Tara might have been asking about if you're referring to the parade that we did last year because graduation was so different. Yeah. Um, only I, I understand April, I would have thought the same thing, but Tara doesn't yeah. have kids at Hopkins, so yeah. she probably no, didn't other people as know what you were. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that is something that the park and rec is mm -hmm. uh, taking over, which we appreciate because it's it's a lot just to plan for graduation. So we're grateful the park, park and rec is taking the lead on that. And cool. I believe the PTO is trying to do some some exciting things for the seniors as well. April, I think the other question um, that will be asked is whether or not the graduation will be live streamed or covered through Hadley Media and made available live given the restriction on the number of physical guests that can be there and many relatives who may not be able to travel. Yeah, so Mr. Sednick and Mr. Fazio are both very kind and generous. And they are helping me as I'm not as in tune with our systems outside or the live streaming. They are assisting with both of those. Mr. Sednick will be talking, if he has not already, to Hadley Media and seeing what we can do around that. I don't know how, I don't know what the quality of the audio will be on that, but Mr. Sednick is very positive and tells me that it will be great and that we can, we can sort that out. So I'm confident that we will have something. Great. Thank you. very exciting. <laughs> it's I hard. Actually, if we do class night in such a way where attendance is limited, we would be looking at live streaming that as well. So we've tossed out a few different ideas of what class night will look like because of some of the limitations to how many people we can have in one place. And so that uh, will be an option for that too. That's great. It, I was going to say, it's hard to believe this is two months away. I mean, crazy. All right. Any other questions on graduation, the guidance from DESE or the draft plans? Okay, thank you, April. Um, next, spring athletics. Well, Ms. Camusa, I'm gonna give this a try because you deserve a break now. So I think that there are just three significant changes. This is nothing the school committee has to vote on. We're just keeping you informed. As you know, Mr. Sudnick works very closely with MIAA, the Massachusetts Interscholastic Athletic Association, to ensure that the way in which we are administering our athletics program is in alignment with all of the guidance put forth by the MIAA and also by the state. In what we are calling fall to spring, I don't even know what that means. It's more confusing to me than the Hopkins schedule, but essentially what I'm just going to call spring, what's coming up, the three big changes are, we will not be limiting play to just schools within our bubble. So um, we will be, because the MIAA, the acronym for the Interscholastic Athletic Association has now indicated that tournament play may be a possibility. And so we will play with our conference. There is a possibility that a tournament will be allowed. We're still waiting to 
see, and we would certainly look to participate if that were allowable. And uh, spectators will also be allowed. Mr. Sednick is communicating directly with athletes and their families to review with them uh, what, how many spectators are allowed and the expectations of spectators. Similarly, COVID screening using a, a self-reporting mechanism, signing in, signing out, yeah, um, along with a number of other precautions. So athletes and their families, should it, if you have not already heard from Mr. Sunday, you should expect to hear directly from him. And we just wanted the public and the school committee to be aware of those three changes that the MIAA has authorized for what I will just call the spring. I should emphasize too that responding to his survey about registration is just like for graduation in terms of he's taking down those names. I think he plans to get each person who gets to attend like a lanyard. So he knows you're supposed to be there. So it is important. To, you can't just bring someone randomly to a game. It does have to be a, a preset of people. So if anyone did not get that email for any reason, which I know did go out already, you can feel free to email him and he can send that to you again. Thanks for clarifying that. And I think it was interesting too, to note that, um, the number of spectators you can have at a home game may be different than the number of spectators that are allowed at an away game, that we can't assume that it's the same rules somewhere else that we may have in place at our fields. Yeah, we did decide to open up our spot a little bit more. We felt like it was important that families were able to attend because we have this space, but we can't guarantee that every other team will have this space or those same rules. So it is important. And he does ask those two different questions to kind of note who would be in that smaller group for away games. But we do have this, the spacing that we need at Hopkins for a slightly larger attendance. Any questions from folks? This is not an action item. All right, appreciate the clarifications. Thank you both. All right, next is the Hartsbrook approval. Annie? Yes, believe it, you approve Hartsbrook annually. The law requires that school committees approve any private school that's operating within their geographic boundaries, uh, K-12 private schools, which is why you approve this every year. The approval process requires Hartsbrook to send over a letter, many, many documents, which I go through their curriculum, their schedule, their registration, their financial documents, um, a number of other things. And I go through a checklist, which is part of school committee policy, uh, policy LBCAE1. I have gone through an E2. I have gone through the checklist. Hartsbrook has uh, met all of the requirements or approval. We're doing this very late because of COVID. We normally do it in October and both Hartsbrook and I realized that we had not yet done it this year. We were too busy doing school plans in the fall. So this is actually for this year. Okay, got it. So is there a motion to um, approve Hartsbrook school for the 2021 school year? Can I just ask what exactly are we approving? The law requires that the school committee approve um, that the school actually can operate in its geographic boundaries. And what you have in the past had in your packet every single document that comes over from Hartsbrook. And in more recent years, I've provided you with a copy of the checklist. So I can tell you I've gone through it and the conditions they have to meet. The school committee policy reflects what the law requires that we evaluate curriculum, um, adequate staffing, staffing that uh, has the knowledge and skills and capacity to deliver the curriculum effectively, their financials, um, their certificates of occupancy. They provided us with all the documentation that's required under the law. Uh, deep down, Paul, I don't know why this law exists. If that's what you're really asking me, I don't know the answer to that. Is it just <laughs> the actual, what, what is the actual approval? But it sounds like there's a long list. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I make a motion to approve Hartsbrook's uh, authorization. Is there a second? Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? Okay. All right, that is approved. Next, we have the review of public health data. Annie? All right, yes, let me share my screen. 
Uh, let me go here. Let me go here. Set that up. There it goes. Okay. All right. So we did see, which is good news. Let's hope that this continues. Um, you can see Hadley, uh, the number of cases in the previous 14 days had decreased. Um, that our average case, daily incidence rate in Hampshire County has decreased and that testing positivity in Hampshire County has also decreased. And we haven't had any recent cases of students or staff in the schools. Um, so let's hope that these things continue. Annie, in looking at this, you know, I had one um, request if it's uh, able to be added on here. At one point in time, we were tracking um, flu vaccinations as because it was a um, at the time something that we thought needed to be adhered to by the end of the year. Uh, but as vaccinations are now available for staff and will be available for um, general public later in April, if it's possible to add just some kind of information around the staff or students that have received a vaccination. It, I understand it would be self-reported and I don't want it to violate any privacy rules looking just for a, a metric, an idea. And it's really, I think, as a follow-up to our survey that we had conducted earlier in the year where we asked if you know the vaccine were made available, would you, would you get it? And overwhelmingly we saw, I think it was over 80%, of the staff had said yes. So it might be good to know where we're at with that, given we have advocated for access to the vaccination uh, for teachers and prioritizing our, our workforce. Um, if there's a possibility of getting a read on where we stand as a district um, from self-reported data. Sure, I would be happy to include that. Let me just ask my other, you know, committee members, does that seem like a reasonable request? I don't want to go outside of any reporting boundaries here, but just what are your thoughts? I like the idea. I was actually, um, I was actually thinking of asking earlier if we had any information on how many teachers were, or staff in general, were able to get vaccinated thus far. Um, I know it's hard to get access, but I like the idea of just having an, a, you know, an update on where we stand in the district. Thanks, Tara. I'm certainly interested, Heather. I'm not. Yeah. I'm not sure what we do with the data, if anything, but it's it is interesting. Um, if it's a low number, I'm not sure what's to be done. If it's a high number, that's good. Yeah. But I would like to know. Yeah, I think maybe it's more um, informational. And you're right, Paul, if it is a low number um, and we do see, you know, a rise in cases, you know, are the two related? Um, if it is a high number or maybe it's a low number and it has to do with access, I, I don't know. And if that's an issue, um, what can we do to support that? You know, um, yeah. just some of the that's considerations that just seem like overwhelmingly folks were seem pretty positive about it back in whatever that was, January, I think, when we surveyed them initially. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Had, had, oh, I'm, sorry. Anecdotally, I'm hearing that it, it's um, it's not trivial to get an appointment for teachers, so they con they continue to have to work hard at it. But that they're that they're that they're getting those appointments. So um, I think all data, you know, ha having access to more data rather than less is always better just helps us make more informed decision making. I know we've had a lot of um, Humera conversations at HES um, because we we have a extremely caring staff. We do in Hadley in general, but um, we've had one teacher who was kind of gone out and um, she actually got last week's Friday staff shout out for it because she's gotten 12 people vaccine appointments out of our staff alone um, on her own time. And so um, Miss Williams worked really hard to get even one of our bus drivers a vaccine and her husband. And so we have had um, conversations as a staff about if you need help getting an appointment, um, we'll, you know, do whatever we can to care for one another and try to get appointments. And Annie's been great about sending information out um, about getting um, 
you know, signed up and information about where to go. And so we, I think the information would be helpful. So if there is an access issue that we're aware of it, and we can continue to try to get staff appointments because it is, it's time consuming. Um, so it's been helpful to have um, the staff helping one another. Exactly. Mm-hmm. That's great. And I know, um, you know, yes, there are weekend options that are set aside within the state, but I also know Annie and um, April and Jen, you've talked about the support that's available during the day as well, if that needs to be what the option is that's available. We're really in a lucky district where we've made a priority. If you can get a shot, I'll cover your class or, you know, somebody will cover your class, you go and get it. And if you're, you know, even for your second shot. So we've really tried to make that a priority for the people who want to get it. Thanks. And, you know, this, this tracking sheet may also be a good place, Annie, to put some of that information about pooled testing um, uh, involvement. Just if we're going to be, trying to monitor, you know, these are all of the initiatives that we've been looking to push forward to support our ability to get back in person. Um, Let's just understand where we stand with those tools. I'd say I'm thrilled to add more data to it because I just don't know what I will do with myself when I just don't have this workbook. More charts. (laughs) (laughs) Is there anything else on the public health data that we need to cover here? No, just the just um, thank you Annie, for continuing. Oh. I, I'm sorry. Just thank you for continuing to collect it. I, I know, w- given what we talked about earlier about recourse and um, our position to be able to do anything about it, I still think it's really important to mm-hmm. continue to collect it and collect more data. So thank you. Of course. Okay, now we're going to move to preschool tuition rates, which is something that we also um, need to vote on an approval. Our, our preschool director, Ms. Winner, put together a spreadsheet that shows what the rates would be with a 1.5% increase this year in fiscal year 21. That's where I'm right now, correct? In fiscal year 21, the rate of inflation uh, to social security income are set by the Office of Social Security for this fiscal year is 1.3%. That's based on inflation for the uh, what's called the trailing 12 months of consumer price index increases. Uh, we are uh, recommending a 1.5% increase to tuitions. And this document demonstrates what that means in terms of the different kinds of tuitions current fiscal year and what it would be next fiscal year. Any questions or concerns about the rate increase? I don't have a question about the rate. I'm just curious when we have an idea about enrollment for the fall, just to know how the program is doing as far as um, kids being enrolled? Sure. Sure. Whoops. Sorry, I should turn that off. This would require a vote of the school committee. Uh-huh. So it sounds like, Terry, you're asking in the future, we'd like to yeah, hear about the enrollment rates. Yes. Sorry, that's how I heard that. I didn't know yeah, if you were, I don't have the enrollment. Actually, I can get it for you if you want the enrollment right now, but I thought you were asking for FY22 for next year. I am asking, yeah, okay. for next year, whenever that is figured yes. out. I'm just curious yes. to compare it, like if, if they're in a better place this year with enrollment. Yes, we I should know, wrote it down. Yeah. We should know more in the next week or so um, when we get our enrollment night together um, for preschool. So we, we should have those numbers pretty soon. Excellent. Okay. To my knowledge, the larger trend still remains in terms of a population decline. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I don't believe I've heard otherwise. Uh, so that in combination with COVID, yeah, I, I'm looking forward to those numbers as well. So I wrote it down, Jen, but you'll remember better than I will because you'll be doing preschool night. So we can make sure it gets on a uh, school committee agenda as soon as we have it. Thank All you. right. Is, is there a motion to approve the preschool rates uh, for fiscal year 2022? I moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed or abstain? Okay. 
All right, that concludes our presentations and discussion items. And now we get to move into business manager reports and Chris, who can lead us through expenses, grants, and the revolving accounts. And I, Chris, I'd just like to point out, Chris, it's Annie. I'd just like to point out that I made a point of making sure I took care of that other math problem so I could listen to every word. I just want to point that out. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, all right, so we can start off with the... Uh, regular expense report with the local budget. Um, again, as, as I've really been saying all year, we're in great shape with this. Uh, you know, we've used about 63% of the budget so far this year. Um, again, it's, it's not exactly just saying, well, we're three quarters through the year and we've only used 63%. So we're, you know, we're, we're doing fabulous. It's, it's not quite that easy because of course we know the June payroll, um, basically is for the summer months as well. So, you know, we do uh, have to take that into account, but even with that, you know, if you look at all of the expense accounts, there's obviously some over and some considerably shorter. Uh, and, you know, if you look at the entire report, we're really in good shape and there's still some changes that need to be made. Um, there are certain expenses COVID related that need to be moved out of the regular budget. We've been kind of parking those expenses here, um, but they do need to be moved. Some of them need to be moved just to COVID grants that we have. Others, um, for example, we've had some subs that we've been paying throughout the year, and those have been paid from the local budget, but they have to actually go to the town COVID money that was, um, it was you know, we were sharing in the use of that money and the payroll, um, portion of it still hasn't been transferred over. So um, we thought we had to do it by uh, December 30th and then they extended the grant. So we said, okay, we can continue to pay them and we'll just move it more towards the end of June. So we're talking a pretty decent amount of money with that too. It's, you know, it's tens of thousands of dollars. So um, again, that's certainly good to see. Um, and it, it, because some of these COVID grants need to be fully spent by June 30th, we will just continue to comb through the expenses that we've seen because there's been so many expenses that are COVID related that, you know, obviously at some point throughout the year, some of them may have gotten paid just from the regular budget instead of from COVID funds. So we'll move those out as well. But again, I can uh, hit that pillow at night and sleep quite well. Um, I'm not laying in bed worrying about the Hadley budget. So uh, that's always a good thing. And and I can assure you, if I can sleep at night, you can as well. So, <laughs> because I'd be the first to be worrying about it. Um, but if you have any questions, I can certainly answer them. Chris, I had one question on page four. Um, the textbooks for the elementary school um, was just the encumbered amount was more than what was budgeted. I was just curious whether that was like a, um, a purchase of brand new set of textbooks or if it had to do with online curriculum or anything like that? Um, it's, it, I don't think it was online curriculum. And if Jen is here, I'm wondering if Jen might be able to jump in. Um, I, I think there was a set of textbooks that they needed to get. And we said we had the funds available, you know, not necessarily in that account, but available to use. Jen, can you bail me out here? Because I just can't remember. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, Chris, we had this agreement. You would keep your camera off and have dinner. And then when you were talking, I would go and have my dinner. <laughs> so could you repeat the question quickly? Yeah, the Jen, textbooks. I was just asking oh, about sorry. the textbook purchase for the elementary school. It just, it, it came up as being um, over the, per the percent used was over what was budgeted. And I just didn't know if it had to do with like an online curriculum or, or anything. No, we were, we were lucky enough. Um, and I had presented on this um, probably a couple months back about our social studies curriculum. So we adopted the TCI program, um, which we really worked hard um, at uh, Mr. Driver was a uh, driving force in um, selecting that. So we had a social studies curriculum. We picked a new program and hopefully um, some we purchased that, which was a big ticket item. But our licenses have, are for the next five or six years. Um, I'll have to go back and check on the date. And okay, so, um, yeah, so that's where that's coming from. Another additional thing that we're also exploring is our English language arts program. 
And so um, Pearson is going, the Pearson program that we're currently using for ELA is um, not going to be available next year. And so we're doing some work right now and we might need to replace that. And so um, I have an English language arts meeting on the 9th. And so hopefully we'll, we'll get a better handle on that. But I think it's, it's a great program. We're really excited to be able to use it. Some of the books have already started coming in. And so that's what we'll be using at Hadley Elementary School for K okay. through six. Yep. Thanks for addressing that. I appreciate it. No problem. Yeah, I owe you a thank you as well, because I, I, I remember the emails back and forth too, but I just couldn't remember what subject it was. So I apologize. Thank you. That's all right. And I, if I remember correctly, there was actually a discount if we could, if we bought, you know, the, the license for X amount of years and knowing we had the funds this year, it was one of those things of, yeah, let's take the discount and pay for it all now rather than, you know, just say, I, just say it was $25,000 and it was for five years. Um, you know, it might have been six thousand dollars a year, but if you paid the full thing, you could get it for basically yep. five thousand dollars a year. It was, you know, something similar to that. So that makes sense. Well, always and chasing actually, the discount, we we jumped on that. And it was one of the cheaper programs that we actually looked into. Um, not that cost drove the decision; it was really the quality of the program that we wanted. And that's when we used the culturally responsive scorecard. And so we really were trying to um, pick a program that's going to meet our needs as a building. And so, um, so we just, we jumped on it. And so we're excited to get that program and, and I'll be happy to give you guys an update. And I'm sure, you know, if you have children, you'll be seeing some things that come home from Hadley Elementary School um, that are from the TCI program. So we're excited. And just if I could add so the public understands, when an individual line goes over at the end of the year, the business manager will present a series of recommendations for transfer to the school committee and the school committee will make sure that all lines are balanced and the bottom line is balanced. I had encouraged Ms. Dowd to do this this year. So if you can see at the bottom of the budget, our bottom line is Chris said he's not concerned because we've utilized 63%. So knowing that the town had requested if it were possible that we deliver a level funded budget on town contribution for next fiscal year, it made the most sense to purchase as much as we could up front this year, because next year will undoubtedly be, could potentially be tighter. So, but it will still balance at the end. So uh, we've encouraged, I've encouraged the principals to where there are purchases that they normally perhaps would make in the summer or next fiscal year to make those purchases now. And we are looking at the English language arts and we did have to purchase the math program last year. And so we should be up to date after this year as far as our curriculum needs. Great, thank you. Okay, any other questions? All right, thank you. Uh, if we could move on to the grants report. It really doesn't look a heck of a lot different this month than what it did last month. Um, Again, the Corona grants were the 102 and 113 and the 118 grants. Those are, for the most part, spent. Uh, the 102 Corona Virus Relief Fund originally was supposed to have been spent by December 30th. So as you can see, we spent the majority of the money um, you know, by this date. Then what happened is, you know, you, sometimes you think you're going to spend a certain amount of money, they put a purchase order through, and then the price changes. And so we end up you know, paying the bill and oops, well, it wasn't quite $2,000. It was only 1500, you know? And so once we went through all of the purchase orders and closed them out, we found ourselves with a couple thousand dollars remaining in the grant. So what we're going to do is to transfer expenses from other areas just to that grant to use it up. Um, it would be the same really with that 113 ESSER grant. You can see we have $29,000 left to spend there. That is another grant that we have to spend by June 30th. So we will definitely uh, you know, transfer expenses over and use that. And the rest of the grants, you can see uh, you know, Title IIA, there's $3,300 left. And Circuit Breaker is a, a larger amount that we still have that we could transfer expenses to. I like to carry over Circuit Breaker if possible, just because we, you know, we're always allowed to up to a certain amount. And um, it would really be nice to just have that um, circuit breaker is kind of a safety net against uh, any potential changes in special ed tuitions. So 
you know, if a child moves in that, that we have to pay to send that child out of district or something, we have that money to cover it, you know, without having to worry about the budget going over. Uh, and the rest of the grants, you can see, you know, Title I, that, that's a payroll thing. It's just going to keep winding down for the rest of the year. The same with Title IV. Um, it's just we, we pay um, a, a teacher and a psychologist from that account, and that will continue to run down. Um, and the other two grants, those are ones we're just going to have to take a look at it, you know, if we're going to be able to spend them this year, or if they might get rolled into a future year, just because with the uniqueness, I guess I should say, of this school year, sometimes it's just hard to run the programs that you kind of anticipated when the grants were written. So uh, those are still unspent at this point in time. But Ann and I usually get together and just kind of get on the same page about her thoughts on spending the grants and you know, my thoughts on, well, this is where we are with them. And uh, you know, we end up just deciding what to do with the funds at that point. So I'm sure we'll have one of those meetings soon. Any uh, grant questions at all? Yeah, a quick question. The um, federal monies that were recently passed by the um, federal government, um, any, in, uh, any money that came in in support of the schools uh, through, I, I guess it would be through the state, would that be on the town side and not listed here or would that appear here uh, at some point? The what federal was money that there? was um, just passed, you mean the stimulus package? Most recently. So there was, uh, in that package was $130 billion for school districts and it was going to pretty much be uh, similar to the ESSER grant and, and we also have an ESSER two that we have not yet applied for. We have to apply by June 30th to use it in the next school year. Um, and a, as far as that goes, the 130 billion is, I, you know, I, I kind of just did an estimate and it was 2.4 times what ESSER two was. So we're, we're looking at roughly, you know, in the $400,000 range for that. The town also receives money uh, as well and in a separate account. So, um, you know, that's something, and, and they're a lot more lenient about the spending of them now versus in the beginning. In the beginning, it was, you know, just, it has to be COVID related and that is it. Now going forward, it's kind of, um, okay, we understand that everybody took a hit here. So now this is to be used for, and, and there's just a number of, you know, ways you can spend it. And the final one is, and, and the whole list of acceptable expenses was, you know, basically, anything you need to spend it on to keep the district as it was. Um, and so <laughs> I can tell you that a lot of districts were very happy to see that because, you know, it, it just gives a lot more leeway uh, to what you can do. But uh, I would point out though, also with that, that these two ESSER two and what, or ESSER three, which is stimulus that those have the ability to be spent over multiple years. That's and correct. There yeah. are, and most districts are just taking a deep breath um, to see exactly what this recovery is going to look like over the long term, what it means for cities and towns, what so those um, that money is not money that uh, I don't think there's any district that some districts, uh, some of our neighboring districts are have absolutely decided that they are not even touching some of that, not all of it, but in some in stim in the case of stimulus, they're not even touching it in fiscal year 22 because it can be spent through, I think, 24. So, but you will see it on the grant sheet because as Chris said, the town gets its own money. Great, thank you. So Chris, just to be clear, so I was reading up on this. So I heard the number like 2.2, 2.3% of what you got before. So, but you're taking 2.2 times the, I'm sorry, not percent, but times the ESSER and the corona, coronavirus relief fund or just the ESSER? Um, it's it's times the S or two. S or two. Uh, so basically, yeah, I'm just looking at, I, I just did a, a quick um, estimate of the amount that we would be getting. And so it's it's two point, let me just click on the cell here. Yeah, it's the S or three money is 239% that the S or two uh, money was. So 239% okay. of what we received last time would be $447,000. So it's a sizable amount. The thing I need to say is that this is all just at this point in time, rough calculations because this, this money still hasn't been released to DESI where they can send it out to all of us and say, Hey, this is how much you're going to get. You know, that 
that part has not been done yet. So it's, it's just one of those things, you know, we know the S or two, S or three, we don't know for sure yet. So it's, and, and you know, my file name is Hadley estimate. And that's really what it is. It's just, you know, an estimate of what we might be getting, but it's, it's, it's not announced yet. And then Annie, once we get that, what's your strategy for how you think about spending it? I get, I get the idea of creating a rainy day fund because we don't know what the future holds, but do we have any pressing so, needs? Well, there are, there are many needs. We've also asked, uh, uh, we've asked, uh, talked a bit with uh, the union about some of their thoughts and about how, uh, what they think would be important. And we've talked as a leadership team. Some of the things we want to keep in mind is we don't want to repeat what, what many cities, towns and school districts did with uh, the land of acronyms in schools. So remember that Recovery Act, it was called ARA funding. Right? And when people, when you invest in things that you have to sustain or stop, you have to be just mindful of what's the plan for when the grant funding no longer exists. So the best approach is usually um, to the extent that it makes sense. And we wouldn't make decisions that, I mean, we want to put student learning at the center. We want to look at the kinds of needs that students exhibit. Uh, this school year when they come back in the summer, next school year, um, if there's learning loss, it does in ESSER 2, so the money that we are applying for by June 30th of this year, uh, at least $10,000 of that needs to be spent on mental health and social emotional supports. But in general, broad sweeping, things like curriculum, capital, stuff. This isn't to say that we wouldn't invest in people. If you're investing in people, contracted services makes more sense than uh, hiring additional employees. Because one, when the funding stops, you have to ask yourself the question of how do you sustain it? But also when you start laying people off, you've just created a financial nightmare for the town. They self-fund for unemployment. So I don't have an answer as to what we've established that those priorities are. We know what the parameters are, but that just gives you an idea of how we're talking about it and how we're thinking. So we'd say, let's define the need, what we believe the need is, what are the data that demonstrate the need, learning loss, behavioral health, ventilation, what are the data that, that support this particular need, and what are the implications of funding each particular possibility in the near term and in the far term? What's the plan for when the grant money isn't there? And if, the, if there is no guaranteed plan, then what are the implications of an abrupt halt and or implications for the town if uh, it results in massive layoffs? Those are the things we're thinking about. Thanks. Any other grant related questions? Okay, um, if we could just jump to the revolving accounts report. Um, a lot of these accounts really just haven't had a heck of a lot of change in them. You can see athletic revolving. We've had no revenues. We've had no expenses since we pulled out the money for the athletic fields in September. So that stayed the same. Lunch has pretty much stabilized now. You know, it's, it's hovered around the $35,000 mark for quite a while. Um, preschool revolving, as I had mentioned, uh, you know, we will be seeing a loss in that account. Uh, we have a negative balance of 39,000 and change now. And if you look, you know, we have four more months. So it looks like we've been running give or take around 10 to $12,000 a month um, in losses. So, you know, just we're looking at another say $60,000 because you have to remember in June, we have the four summer month or four summer payrolls that we'll be paying as well. So June will be a little bit of a bigger hit, but and then we'll have to just transfer expenses back to the local budget to uh, bring that back up to a positive balance. Um, student activity, it's, it really hasn't changed a heck of a lot. Hadley Kids has been the same for months. And the school choice, other than when I transferred some expenses to it in December, now you can just see it's growing every month um, by you know close to $50,000. And uh, I believe we have about another... $375,000 or so that we would be using. And I do anticipate that we would use that money um, only because we had told the town 
that we would be giving back a certain um, portion of this year's budget to them. So, you know, to offset that, we will be using the school choice money to whatever extent we need to. It might not be the full 375, but, uh, you know, whatever we need to just to get us back up to zero. Chris, I, Any have, question? Question. Oh. I, do. I have a question for you about lunch. Sure. Uh, I've always considered that to be um, going up and down depending on whether students and parents are paying their, um, their you know, meal um, or whether there's a balance owed. Um, since June to present day, it, the account has gone down by 33,000. I, I, so my question is two part. Number one, the 68,000 that we start with, is that um, money that comes out of our budget every year that you know we set aside a certain amount to start with and then that draws down um that's question one and then mm -hmm. question two is what do, uh generally what are the categories that we spent that thirty three thousand on um so payroll is a big portion of it obviously uh, you know that's our biggest but with the lunch accounts a lot of what we spend is front-loaded um you know, over the summer months, any kind of repairs that are made are done and, and paid for by the lunch account. Uh, you know, packaging materials, especially this year where we have a lot of, say, paper products or containers to package the lunches, that all uh, goes, uh, you know, is purchased in the summer. So it's front loaded with the expenses for the year. Um, and then, of course, you know, the cost of food as well. And the food is, is obviously spread out over the entire year because Diane buys a lot of it in the beginning and, you know, a, a lot of it is frozen, but she also buys a large amount of fresh foods. And so those would be coming in, you know, basically on a weekly basis. So, so we pay for them on a weekly to monthly basis as well. Um, the thing about the lunch account that's a little bit different than the preschool account is that the lunch account, we don't have, um, you know, the summer payroll to be charged to it like we do with the preschool account where we would have that four additional paychecks, at, you know, as the lunch employees are hourly with the exception, uh, exception of, the, uh, of the director, they get paid only when they work, you know, so obviously that would stop at that point in time. And we do have a certain amount budgeted uh, for Diane Zach's salary, uh, basically in the regular budget. I'm scrolling through the report here and I'll be darned if I can find it, but I think it was around $40,000 that um, when That's we were correct. preparing the budget, we just said, you know, we should probably put this in the budget to pay for Diane's salary just because of the fact that we knew how, how much the lunch account was struggling in general. And so, you know, we'll be making that transfer as well. Uh, you know, before the end of the year. So, and we have something budgeted in next year's, you know, proposed budget as well. I'm curious about the, um, the deal with the federal government that allows us to offer lunch free for the whole year mm -hmm. and how, how that money flows in and out. Well, uh, so the money, first of all, it's, it's a big deal for us because what they end up doing since all lunches are free they end up reimbursing the school for the free lunch price, which is usually, it's about, and I'm, I'm just rounding, but it's about $4 a lunch versus the lunch cost that I think we have, which I think it's three twenty-five. dollars So we're getting 75 cents more per lunch. And I know that doesn't sound like much, but when you're talking, you know, 450 to 500 kids times 180 days before, you know, that 75 cents really adds up a lot. So what we're going to see the lunch reimbursements are always about two months behind. And if you look at the revolving account report and the lunch portion of it, you can see how June 30th, we had 68,000. July, we had 69. Then it actually went down a little bit in August because with last year, with no lunches or almost no lunches being served, you can see how we got next to nothing in revenues for those two months, you know, like $1,000 or so. Um, this year, for revenues, we're seeing closer to, uh, you know, from 10 to $13,000 a month. So what that's going to do is we're going to finish June 30th with 
you know, just say, uh, you know, $50,000 or so. Then in July, whereas this July, we got a thousand bucks, we're going to probably get May's payment, which would be ten to $13,000. And then in August, we're going to get June's reimbursement, which is only half a month. So we're probably going to get, you know, $6,000 or something for that. But it's still considerably more than what we saw this year. So, I mean, these accounts, I mean, it, it's a constant churning and, and it's a constant movement of expenses. But I, I'm, you know, so I'm trying to just explain it in simple terms that basically we're going to have it grow this summer like we don't normally see it grow because we're just, we're getting reimbursed for more lunches, so. Got it, thank you very much. Okay. Any other questions on the revolving accounts? Any other questions at all? Okay, maybe I'll duck behind that black curtain again then. <laughs> all right, thank you very much. Just reach out if you have any other questions during the meeting, I'll be here. Thanks, Thanks Chris. Chris. Okay. Okay, we're gonna to move to the school committee reports, um, starting with the collaborative, Humera. Yes, um, thank you. I um, reported out at the last meeting about our January board meeting and this Wednesday is our next board meeting. So I'm looking forward to attending that. Um, as a, as a, an aside, I'll just mention that one of the programs at the collaborative is holding a um, racial justice um, conference. It's like a one or two day conference. And I asked nicely and was able to be invited to attend that and attend some pretty great sessions. And they said, we don't normally do this and don't tell anyone. And I realize I'm telling you all, but um, it's with the understanding that I will bring back some information for all of us um, to share. Great, thank you. All right, finance, Ethan, anything, any activity on that besides the uh, public hearing of the budget coming up next month? Yeah, I mean, uh, obviously the budget's been kind of, uh, the process has started uh, with the budget. I, last week, there was a meeting, real simple, just kind of trying to figure out dates for when they could talk to each department about their budget. So Annie will be meeting with uh, the town administrator and the finance committee soon. Great, thank you. All right, and then policy, um, you guys are actually resuming tonight. Am I wrong on that? <laughs> we are, it's, um, okay. it's a late night. We're yes, three hours. we'll try to wrap this up then. Um, I do see we have a couple of folks still left with us that aren't co-hosts. So I do see Jane Nevinsmith on here. I will yeah. make you a co-host, uh, Jane, in case you do have any announcements. Um, so at this point, let's just move to announcements anything from folks Heather, can i can i say something about the fields what's that Heather, would you mind if i say something about the fields oh not at all fields paul just, just wanted you all to know that um you previously had given me authorization to approve small expenditures and so i did approve one uh, purchase of some lilac bushes uh, along uh, one of the abutters so I think it was about $2,600, a little bit over than that. Those will be planted this spring. So that was part of our uh, one of our agreements with one of the abutters to the pack. Thanks, Paul. Yeah. All right. Um, any other school committee reports? Not All a right. school committee report, but an announcement. Okay. Announcements. Kumara, let's start with you. Okay. I just wanted to make a quick announcement that... Um, uh, Hadley Learns has an exciting two-part program on um, the history of U.S. housing discrimination and local housing policy. And actually, the history of U.S. housing discrimination is fascinating. Uh, like, it, it might sound boring to some, but actually, it is riveting. And so I highly recommend that you all check out the program, um, even if you weren't planning on coming to the program, which is this Thursday at 7 o'clock, by Zoom, then I, we recommend that you check out the resources that we shared to get up to speed on what some of those issues are um, so that you can find at hadleylearns.com. Thanks, Humara. Jane, thank you for uh, joining us. So do you have any announcements on behalf of the town and the select board? Yes, Mother's Club will have candidates night on April 5th, seven o'clock, a Zoom meeting. And elections are the 13th, all day at the Senior Center. Excellent. Thank you very and much. I want to add, and Jane can correct me if I'm wrong, I believe the annual town meeting 
because I have to make sure I do the building use form. Uh, Saturday, May 22nd, with a rain date on Sunday, May 23rd, outside okay. like it was last year at Hopkins. That's right? correct. Okay, just before graduation. All right. And I would point out for the graduating people, the sound system really works well. You figure out how the select board set it up for town meeting because it should be fine for your graduation. Excellent. Thank you, Jane, for that. Any other announcements for tonight? I guess I have one other announcement. Um, I wasn't, um, and maybe it's actually a question for Annie. Annie, did you have anything to say about the uh, incredible virtual field trip that the um, entire school went on? Um, I, cer I certainly can say because all three of my kids attended and uh, I, I was actually lucky enough to go to a number of those sessions, but um, it was so well done. What a gem of a resource we have in our region and what an incredible initiative on the part of uh, Principal Dowd and um, and also Principal Camuso, but Principal Dowd really took the lead on that. And, and um, But Annie, did you have any words on that? I share your awe and appreciation. And uh, actually, we're very grateful to UMass. Uh, the principals and the folks from UMass will be having kind of a debrief, I think, this Friday, uh, I believe. Um, but yeah, remarkable work. It was an idea that Ms. Dowd had, and she talked with Ms. Camuso. And one thing they know how to do is plan. So they came up with a really involved plan to make it happen. And it was, uh, as you saw in the paper, it was well received by the students, well received by the community. And it's in a lot of places now. It's on UMass's website, a nice article in the Gazette. Um, it was really well done. They did great work. And if I may just further mm -hmm. add, um, you know, I am I should know, um, but I don't. And so just in case someone else out there doesn't know, um, W.E.B. Dubois was born in Massachusetts, lived almost to like almost close to 100 um, from almost the like early emancipation days to the eve of um, voting rights. So the civil rights era, like his lifespan spanned all that time. Um, he was one of the few black individuals to graduate from high school, let alone from college and go on to get his PhD from Harvard. And essentially was one of the forefathers who um, invented sociology. Um, and just what an incredible resource we have at, um, at the library. They have a whole center and an archive dedicated to his life and his accomplishments, artifacts, the whole bit and age appropriate content for all the students from K all the way to 12. So just in case you didn't know a bit about him, I certainly, I didn't, um, we're all learning, um, but that's, um, that's a thumbnail on, on W.E.B. Dubois. That's great. And thank you for mentioning that. I know uh, I was happy to see the Gazette highlighting that in a recent um, paper. All right. Any other announcements for tonight? Okay. Uh, we've, let's see, we've handled two of our action items, but we do have one remaining, the approval of the minutes from February 22nd, 2021. Some corrected minutes were sent out. Um, either earlier today or late last night. <laughs> I think very early this morning. Uh, any questions or um, comments on the minutes or is there a motion to approve? I'll make a motion to approve. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, our next meeting date will be April 26th. We'll have the public hearing of the budget. Um, and Ms. Wittelitz, you are the winner for the last remaining uh, member of the public that is not a co-host. So gold star for you. Uh, and I, is there a motion to adjourn the regular meeting and um, the policy subcommittee, subcommittee will convene separately? So moved. Second day. All in favor? Aye. 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 Have a good policy subcommittee meeting. <laughs>